This will probably come as no surprise. I have no grasp on jewelry or its trends. But even with my very limited point of view, I can see a lot of value in buying accessories that look like diamonds and sapphires without the price tag or the guilt. And I have just the person to reinforce that opinion today. Welcome to the Just Dumb Enough podcast, a show that acknowledges no one is always an expert by dispelling misconceptions with real experts. I'm your host as always, Colton Petrie. My guest today is Vicky Lemaire. Vicky has been designing jewelry for Hollywood stars since 1984. Those nearly four decades of experience have taught her a lot about the market trends and tastes of people who purchase jewelry in general. It's also displayed the fine line between jewelry inspired by a design and a knockoff or replica of an exact design. Do you know where that line is? She's also done a host of other jobs, from acting to private investigating, which we'll discuss briefly towards the end. Remember, you can email dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com or send a message to any of the social media pages to request future topics or guests. For now, let's spend less and accessorize more. Welcome to the show, Vicki Lemaire. Oh, hi, Colton. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being on the show. Why don't you introduce yourself for the audience? Uh, my name is Vicki Lemaire, and I am the author of the new book called Saving Face. And we'll be talking about that and many other things in my life. <laughs> yes, you do have quite a career history. Yes, I do. I do. I um. I came to Hollywood uh, to find fame and fortune <laughs> and I found a little bit, but not enough to sustain me. So I was very fortunate to um, actually get into the costume jewelry business um, in 1984. So that's like 38 years ago, I think almost. And um, I was just um, buying some pins from my uh, girlfriend from my sisters for Christmas she had these big pins that were popular back then. Michael Jackson, I think, was the one that started wearing them and made them so popular. So I bought those for my sisters. And then she said, you know, you can go downtown to my friend and get them wholesale. You don't have, you know, buy them for me. And so I ended up going downtown and went to this little manufacturing place. And I started buying pins from this lady. And she would sell them to me for $5 and I, I would resell them for $15. They were gorgeous, you know, and it was like such an easy way to make money. So I set up a little briefcase and I would have the pins, you know, those sweater pins and regular pins and uh, wherever I would go. I like if I went to have lunch, I would open my case and pretend I was straightening. <laughs> and of course, women, when they see costume jewelry, anything that sparkles, you know, they're Oh, what's that? Where did you get? Can I buy one of those? I said, sure. You know, so I would end up selling like at the bank, at the grocery store, wherever I would go, I would just accidentally open my briefcase and there, you know, there my sales started. So after a couple of months of buying stuff from her, she said, you know, I have fulfilled my order for the store. She had like a $200,000 order for, from, I think it was Contempo Casuals. And so she had fulfilled that. And she said, I have all these pieces left and stones. And would you be interested in buying my business? And I said, yeah, you know, what's left of it. So um, we made a really good deal. And I bought all her stones and her parts and everything. And I started on my journey of making jewelry. And I had the most fun, I think. I remember one night I was sitting making stuff. And I looked at the clock and it was 2 a.m. And I went, oh my God, I've been doing this for six hours. So it's just crazy, you know, and I really enjoyed it. So that's how I started. Yeah. And what, what separates like your standard jewelry from costume jewelry? Like where's the terminology come in? So costume jewelry is, is made basically from pot metals, brass that is coated with either silver or gold. So costume jewelry also fits in the category. There's some things that are gold filled. Well, that would be 
much better quality. But costume jewelry um, is made with crystals. I particularly love the, the Shirovsky crystals because they have so many facets in them and they look more like diamonds. I mean, people can't tell the difference to the naked eye. And for women, all it has to do is sparkle and they love it, you know? So it doesn't have to be real. So costume jewelry is made with um, not real uh, gold or silver and not real stones as diamonds, emeralds. You know, it's just a copy of the real thing. I would say that's the best way to describe it. Gotcha. It's like a dressed up version of something where you're like, yeah, if you don't, you don't take it to an appraiser, you're not looking to, to sell it or to make a fortune off of it. It's going to look very nice. Yeah, it looks good. You know, it, it makes your outfit, the costume jewelry makes your outfit. And, you know, for people that can't afford to be buying diamonds and, you know, and I think real jewelry is kind of boring compared to costume jewelry. Sure. And it definitely seems like for the price you would pay for you know, a ring with a big diamond on it, you could buy a whole bunch of costume jewelry. Yeah, I have a, an interesting story. I was uh, working in this boutique up uh, in Mulholland where all the movie stars live. And um, it was half a lingerie store and half a an alteration store. And the lady wanted me to work. She only needs someone one day a week, which was perfect for me. I said, I'll do it if you let me put my costume jewelry in here. You know, so she goes, okay, just not too much, you know, blah, blah, blah. So one day uh, in comes Priscilla Presley. And she was so sweet and nice, very shy. And she was getting her alterations and she stopped over at the counter. And she was looking at this big cross I had. And it was like, it, it was a large cross that it was crusted with uh, green like emeralds, red like rubies, clear like diamonds, and blue like sapphire stones. And she said, oh my God, I'm going to buy that and take it to my jeweler and have them make it with real stones. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> you know, so yeah, Feel free what... to buy it as a template. <laughs> yeah. My, I, I had many star encounters in my stores. Yeah, yeah I would imagine. And like you said, you know, 38 years in Hollywood, especially like 38 years speaks for itself, but 38 years in Hollywood seems like an entirely different world where everything is like moving so fast and changing on a whim. Yeah, I was lucky. Um, the first year I was in business, my fiance said, you know, you should have your own little store uh, on Melrose. Melrose Avenue at that time was a very trendy area with fun restaurants and stuff. So um, we found a little store. It was probably only 300 square feet. It was tiny and long and narrow. And I mirrored both sides to make it look bigger. And um, yeah, I, that's where I would sit all day and make stuff. And, and I would, you know, have a few customers. I wasn't real busy, but I did have some uh, wonderful star customers come in there. Um, uh, what's her name from Laverne and Shirley? I forget her name. Anyway, uh, Nicholas Cage and uh, Joyce DeWitt from Three's Company. Of course, those are all old shows. But <laughs> you know, it was, just, it was just really... Oh, and, and Joni Mitchell. That was my favorite customer. Oh, also um, uh, Natalie, Natalie Cole. She was just lovely. She bought my jewelry at the, at the lingerie store. So, yeah, and I used to um, sell to all the major department stores. I started with... Um, Nordstrom's uh they bought stuff for their junior department I made these long shoulder duster earrings with fringes and oh the girl just went crazy for them and you know I didn't I mean I, I made them out of um the stuff that the mylar that's left after you punch the sequins out I was bending that into little bows and putting the top I mean I just came up with these ideas it was like all of a sudden I I had this artistic ability that I didn't know I had, you know, and I think it came from my, um, my new uh, Buddhist practice that, that allowed me to, to tap into this area that I never knew I had, you know, I think there's many forms of being creative and being artistic, but um, this was a total uh, surprise to me. When I was growing up, my mother always said, oh, you're not artistic because you can't draw. 
like your sister. And so I always thought, you know, it was like, what a horrible thing to tell a child. So it kind of dwarfed me for a while. But then when I started making jewelry, and then I realized because I was also writing poems and songs and stories, and, you know, I would write my my stand-up comedy. I did, I've been doing stand-up comedy for over 25 years and I write all my own material. So there, there's a creative side in all of us that um, is one of the seven basic human needs to be creative, whatever that means to you. It's, it's something that's important. It's certainly one of those, especially in, you know, today where we have so much more exposure to the world and everything going on out there that like, there is a very broad definition to artistic where it's like, what kind of art? There's 5 million kinds of them. Take your pick and try them out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And like you said, in this case, it just kind of, it took off for you. You know, you're like, oh, I guess I'll, I'll try making something and, oh, that worked out well. I'll try making this other thing and that's working out even better. I don't know. I don't know if I'm on to something or if it's just easy for me. Yeah, one time I made these earrings, I, um, I had these uh, big thin hoops and and they were like kind of crooked. And I just, one day I just took one and I just twisted it up because I was kind of mad that I couldn't use it as a hoop. And I went, that looks like an atom. Oh, I'm going to make these. These are my atom earrings. And they were like these, they looked like the DNA code, you know, I just twist them and I, those sold like crazy. I mean, it was just like, I was so happy with myself that I had come up with this idea on my own. Yeah, and my business, um, you know, so I ended up selling to Nordstrom's, uh, Bullock's. I used to go to Bullock's every weekend and stand on my feet for eight hours selling my jewelry. And uh, they would take 60% and I would get 40, um, which, you know, that was okay. I mean, I think I used to make about 500 a weekend. And then um, they... One Christmas, I sold 40000 in their store, and they went bankrupt, and they never paid me. And it just about wiped me out because wow. I had put all my energy and my money into that and working, making it, designing it, selling it. It's like I was like a one-man band, you know. I had people help me at different times, but they would get glue on the stones so the stones wouldn't be pretty and shiny anymore. So I got, I got rid of um, my help. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not going to have people that, you know, are going to ruin my stuff. So I, I became, um, you know, I probably didn't grow as, as a manufacturer and a designer um, and, and a salesperson because I was so, I had to do everything myself, you know, that's probably a weakness, but I couldn't delegate because I, it, I wanted it perfect. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I will not. I will not sacrifice my quality for the sake of putting out more quantity. Exactly. And at, so um, I ended up uh, going back when it was Macy's and I started doing the trunk shows in the store again. And then I, I had one time I had seven Saks Fifth Avenue stores carrying my jewelry. That was a coup because, you know, that's like the most prestigious store, you know, wealthiest people and, so um, when I could see my jewelry in Beverly Hills, Saks Fifth Avenue, in, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, so that was probably the pinnacle. of, But they, that was on consignment. So they would only pay me when they sold something, you know. So it wasn't that lucrative, really. But I ended up uh, selling to iMagnon, um, Robinson's May, most of the major department stores. So, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it, it wasn't like I was doing that well, but it sustained me. I call it my sugar daddy because it's always paid the rent or the market, you know. It's just something you can sell costume jewelry to women anytime, anywhere. I would drop the business and I would pick it up again. And it was just something that I could, I could do, you know, um, at will. I, I had a a cart in a mall at one time. And then I used to do arts and craft shows. And yeah, I'm I, like at Christmas time, I could easily sell $10,000, which was in one month, which was great, you know? 
but that's not profit of course you got to buy the stuff you got to make you know sure all yeah. of your your energy and your time and your resources yeah. well, i was working 14 hours a day because i'd sell in the daytime i'd come home at night i'd be sitting making putting more stuff together and yeah, I worked, I worked really hard, you know, it wasn't, but, but it was lucrative, you know, when, when, you know, the holiday seasons, gift seasons, I mean, this is my season coming up. Yeah. So right, right. now I have a, I have a little boutique inside a, um, a beauty salon and that's where I have my stuff set up, but I also go out, you know, I go out and I do retirement homes and I do, uh, I have one coming up at a golf club. It's a luncheon, you know, where all these women come. Wherever you have women, you can sell jewelry. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, have there been a lot of changes over the, you know, these almost four decades where you've been selling this? Or has it maintained, like, pretty consistently where you're like, no, I just find store, sell in store, like, haven't had to worry too much? You know, it it's like everything. It It changes over the years. As far as like at one point, nobody will wear gold. Everybody's wearing silver, silver, silver. And then all of a sudden gold starts to become more popular. And it's I notice it's a 20 year cycle. So right now gold is more popular than silver, which is, you know, uh, I'm fortunate I can wear both. But some people are very like, oh, no, I only wear gold. Oh, I only wear silver. That's fine. And, you know, um, so I carry both in my line. I have, you know, a little bit of everything. I have simple things, little nice little earrings, but I have big stuff for the women that want the gaudy look. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it it changes. Like I, I've seen um, hoops come and go at least ten times over my career because <laughs> you think, oh, they're out. No, oh, they're back in. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you know that that's just. I think I think it's a staple that that is hoops. I mean, I, I sell a ton of hoops, all different sizes, and I've gotten it down to, I know exactly what women like. They like lightweight and they like a little uh, one that flips up in the back so that they don't lose it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it makes me think of like how often clothing style changes, which is really fast and pretty frequent. And I'm like, does it do the same thing in jewelry? Does it have that same kind of like volatility? And then I would think like, well, there's got to be a little more stability in it than that, right? Well, it's funny because right now the popular thing is these paper clip ear uh, necklaces. And they look exactly like paper clips if they were joined together. That's the shape of them. But you'll see, see Billie Eilish wearing it and any of the newscasters that all have these special... Um, the woman, uh, Leslie Stahl, on 60 Minutes every week, she's got her paper clip necklace. And, um, you know, and of course, they're wearing them in real gold and real silver. So I have the uh, knockoffs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so we, um, that's a very popular item right now. And, and that's trendy. I mean, obviously, you know, that'll come and go. And I can't tell you what the last trend was, but I'm probably stuck with a few of them. <laughs> Because yeah. because pe- women get really uh, fickle about, you know, what's in and what's not in. Sure. Is there anything that's like just stayed extremely consistent over the last, you know, 38 years? Well, I think um, a pretty stud earring is, is pretty consistent, you know, uh, with nice crystal. And then, of course, like I said, the hoops. And women, you know, we used to wear a lot of these uh, stretchy bracelets with the stones on them. That's kind of gone out of style, um, although it was it was around for a long time. Uh, people now are looking for copies of designer stuff. But what's been happening is, like, I used to carry um, some, I have to word this correctly, inspired by Cartier uh, bracelets. <laughs> And um, the people that I was getting them from got busted. They were selling them online and it, w- it was an exact copy, only not in gold or silver, you know, with, with the, the little nail mark w- where they had stones. Some had the nail mark, some had just the stones. So they got busted on and I said, I, you know, I have a customer that wants three of them. She, they said, no, we can't do it anymore. 
we're, we got rid of it all because we got in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so. Too close to the original. Yeah. So I do, I do carry some um, uh, things that are inspired by designers and um, you know, uh, people recognize that and it's, it's a very popular thing right now. Yeah. And has this, the, the audience, so to speak, that purchases this kind of jewelry, has it grown over the years as it started to become more socially acceptable for other people to start wearing it? Like other, you know, men in some of the alternative communities, like start to wear a lot more jewelry. Have you seen a lot of uptick or a lot of change in the styles that people like? You know, I just think it's so general. It, it really, to me, because I've seen it all. I've seen it all and it's come back. And people, you know, younger people will think it's new, but it's been around. And I have, I, I at one time made leather necklaces for, who was it? Was it Nordstrom's or Macy's, their men's department at Christmas? And, you know, I just put beads on it. And, and I've also had leather bracelets that, that men wear, you know, even though they might be for women, if they have a small enough wrist, um, they could fit certain bracelets. So I, I do sell to men as well. Um, and men do like jewelry and I'm, I'm happy to make stuff for them because I, you know, I have the leather and I have the, the turquoise beads and, you know, different colors I can do. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it's become more readily acceptable that men wear bracelets too. And of course you've seen the, basketball stars when they're on the bench and they're injured wearing their big diamond necklaces i was like i'm so surprised <laughs> like why would they want to wear a, a diamond necklace like a woman but i guess if they can afford it you know why not like i see lebron and anthony davis you know when they're when they're on the bench and they're injured and they're in their street clothes they always have their diamonds and their di I even saw LeBron had a bunch of the designer bracelets you know the women's ones and I'm thinking well he had to have those made for him because I don't think they would have come in his size you know yeah he's quite a large individual compared to I think the yeah. average female <laughs> yeah so he probably had them specially um made up for him but it you know, they're certainly not, um, you know, if, if they can do it, anybody can do it, you know? Yeah. And I've seen, um, like, even on The Voice, uh, there's a guy that wears these pearl necklaces. And I'm thinking, that's really interesting. You know, he, he's got a family. and But that's his style. He likes it. And why not? Men should be able to, to wear nice jewelry, too. <laughs> yeah, of I course. Not Just... wearing earrings too big, but, you know. <laughs> Little ones look good. Diamonds look great. Yeah, it's just an accessorizing. Yeah, I, I sell studs to guys all the time. Um, cubic zirconians, you know, because they look just like diamonds. Nobody could tell the difference. Yeah. Are there a lot of like misconceptions when people come to you and they're like, oh, in costume jewelry, there must be X, Y, and Z things. And you're like, no, I don't, I don't have any of those problems or I don't have to work with any of that. There are a lot of misconceptions. Well, you know, what I do is women are concerned about um, the posts and what they put in their ears. So, um, you know, there, there, there was a problem at one time with nickel and alloys. So now most, most of the stuff that I purchase and that I make things with is all hyperallergenic surgical steel. That's the only thing I use. And I will only buy earrings that say lead compliant, no nickel, no lead, so, so that the women can be comfortable. Because some people are allergic to pot metals, you know, the, 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 um, the fake uh, silver and gold. And, and um, they can only wear real, real stuff. Well, that's okay, too. <laughs> but I, I haven't found women that really ever can't wear my stuff I put out a guarantee when I sell stuff if it breaks or something happens I replace it or fix it free of charge that's my deal and and I guarantee it for life and they go one woman said to me life well whose life your life my life or the jewelry's life 
I said, well, whichever comes first. You know? yeah. So I, I do guarantee. You. Yeah, I mean, women love stuff that looks real, but they don't have to pay for it. And especially lately with all the snatch and grabs, uh, thefts that are going on, you know, women are not wearing their real jewelry anymore. So I'm, it's really great for me because I can sell them stuff that looks real. And if somebody tries to, wants it, they can go here or take it. You know? Yeah. All 40, right. Fine. <laughs> Forty dollar ring. It's like it looks like you know half a million. <laughs> sure. I wore I wore one of my big big, big diamond looking rings into the bank one day, and it's a six carat cubic zirconia, but it looks so good. I mean, it's a big uh, princess cut uh, diamond look, and um, all of a sudden they're they looked at my ring and went, oh, Miss Lemaire, oh, what can we, can we help you? Is there anything we can do? Like they, they treated me totally differently because they thought I had this like million dollar ring, you know? Yeah. Like, I can't believe people are so superficial. <laughs> you know? Going back a little, when you're talking about like, oh, these, you know, alloys and things people couldn't wear and why we switched over to like surgical steel or things like that, is that the... I'm only vaguely familiar with it where people were saying like, Oh, I can't wear that. It'll turn my skin green. Yeah. Yeah. People were concerned. I mean, everybody's um, chemistry is different. So certain women can't wear, they turn everything black, even silver turns black on their fingers, you know, so it depends on how much, um, what, what's your composition is, you know, so it's, there's no guarantees for anyone. But, you know, some people have more acid in their skin than others. And so that that turns things dark, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't, but, I wasn't aware of that, but it's, it also is like another good reason to kind of, you know, use this like looks genuine jewelry, right? Where you're like, I'm not going to pay thousands of dollars for it just for it to like change color on me. Exactly. Well. That's why, you know, I mean, if they spend 20 bucks and they get to wear it for a year, you know, I think that's great. I mean, can they ask for more than that? Uh, I, I mean, I have stuff I've had for a long time and, you know, it definitely um, after years and years of wear, it may change. Some stuff doesn't. It depends on the quality. Stainless steel is they're doing a lot of stuff with stainless steel today and stainless steel doesn't change colors. So it's really good. So how did you kind of, yeah, we talked about like you have all these years in stand up and you did some acting and stuff along the way. how did you manage to like keep up with all of these things at the same time? It seems like a lot to juggle. Well, you know, um, when I came to Hollywood, I, I was coming to, to become an actress and I was fortunate enough um, in the first two years, um, I got a movie and I got my SAG card and then I got a TV series and I got my after card. So SAG is for film and commercials and after is um, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. So that's more for, for um, TV, you know, TV and, um, and radio and things like that. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to be a big star. I'm on my way, you know. And then, of course, I got one job a month or, you know, this and that. And it's like, I can't make a living on this. I have to do something else, you know. And that's when I started my jewelry business, which was so nice because I could drop it or pick it up at any time. And I, if I had an acting job, put a sign on the window, I'll be back in two hours, you know. It was great. And then also, that's not the only job I had, though. When I first moved here, um, I was selling eyeglass frames, you know, out of a, but I was here, uh, I came uh, across the border with three kids, a cat and a dog in a camper. And um, I was here uh, illegally for a, a, a while till I got my green card. Um, and so I was kind of working under the table with the eyeglass frames. I think I, I only got a hundred dollars a week. So it wasn't very much, but I had a case and I'd go around and see optometrists. Then my friend told me about, she's my sister's doing this job. She's a, works as a private investigator. 
and she does, um, you know, she goes out and eats and then she writes reports on the restaurants and she drinks, you know, the, you have to drink and you have to eat because you have to watch the bartenders. So I said, that sounds like a great job. I'd love to do that. So I went over and I met with the owner and he hired me and I started doing the, this private investigating work. Um, and, you know, we'd go out and eat and write reports. And I, I got, we had five Mexican uh, restaurant chains. I think we had Red Onion, Maria's, Casam, Casa Maria's and uh, Acapulco. But I got so tired of Mexican food. <laughs> I didn't even want to eat it anymore. Um, and, and it was very negative work because you were looking for people to mess up, to make a mistake. And I just found it so negative. And then my boss taught me how to do background um, research where I would do a background study on maybe somebody's going through a divorce and they're trying to find the money and you know, where, did, where did they hide it? And blah, blah, blah. So I go through all the records. I go downtown and pull the records, go to the federal building, go to the civil courts. In those days, we had to look up the microfish, put the person's name in. Now everything's on the computer. It's so much easier. Um, but then we also did surveillance, and we had some very interesting people that we surveilled, um, one of them being Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. And that was quite an interesting job because we sat all day just outside his house watching his activities. And uh, we were working for the doctor that supposedly took care of him. And he was trying to find uh, dirt on the caregiver so that he could fire her, or take money away. I, it was just, you know, it was just like, and, and you know, the poor guy, he was out of it. He would just be walking in the street going, tree. And then we would hear him practicing or, or trying to play the piano. and. He would start singing and then he, East Coast girls are hip, and East Coast girls are hip, and he couldn't remember the sentences. It was so sad, you know. I think that was probably at his lowest point. So this woman was not taking care of him. You know, she, she basically, um, there's one story I can't even tell you because it's just too awful. But anyway, um, that was one of the things we did is and we followed people around and put devices on their car. And it was scary. Some of it was kind of scary work. But um, I did that for seven years and then I gave it up. And that's when I started my jewelry business. And, you know, so I've done a little acting and uh, I've been in movies and television and I've been on stage and. Like I said, I've done stand-up comedy for over 25 years. And I've performed at the Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard and various other venues. And um, I love doing stand-up comedy because I love making people laugh. It's just a great pleasure. And um, yeah, lots of irons in the fire over time. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, you do, you do what you can to get by. Of course. Okay course any like really hard-earned lessons along the way that you try and share with people when you run into people trying to follow the same paths now i just feel like every hardship is a lesson learned and you know you have to be resilient in life so it doesn't matter what knocks you down it's it's not how hard you fall it's how high you bounce back that matters and I think you have to be able to be resilient and keep keep a sense of humor about things. Be happy. Smile. It's, it's good exercise for your face. It takes 47 muscles to smile and only seven to frown. And it, smiling is a great facial exercise. So, you know, I recommend that in my book um, and also facial exercises. But a lot of my beauty tips are spiritual ones because uh, what I've learned that I can pass on is that when you blame other people for whatever's happened to you, nothing will change in your life. You'll just keep recycling that karma, shall we say. But when you take responsibility, this is my life. I attracted this and I can change it. 
Um, that's when my life changed. Um, I was in, uh, brought up in an abusive home and then I had two abusive marriages and I was miserable really, you know, I was like, just, I wasn't, was not a happy person, even though I was nice looking and I could work as an actress and I could perform. There was something missing inside of me, you know, because I had this resentment for what my mother did to me, what my father did to me, what my husband did to me. And when I started to practice Buddhism, I was pointing my finger at everybody, you know, and my uh, Buddhist leaders took my finger and turned it around to me. They said, it's you. I said, it's me. I didn't. It's you. You have to take responsibility for your life. It, it came into your life. So it's yours. And the, the moment that, that I could get that concept of taking responsibility for what has happened to me, my life changed. I was in the driver's seat for the first time. I was controlling what happened in my life. Instead, before that, the universe was slapping me around like a rag doll. You know, I go here, bam, here, bam. You know, it's like, okay, well, it just kept repeating itself. So I never thought it would change, but the change was the change in me. So the, the reflection I saw in the universe was, was different. And I started changing from the inside out and growing this diamond-like life condition that we all possess that was really lying dormant, you know, and I had to grow it. So one of my beauty tips and secrets is to, to exercise not only your body and your mind every day, but to exercise your spirit, you know, pray. I don't care if, if, whether you're Christian or Jewish or Buddhist, just pray every day to raise your life condition so that you look at your problems. Like I was looking at my problems from the basement, looking up and they were overwhelming. But when I started to chant and raise my life condition, I was looking at my problems from the penthouse. So instead of like falling into a pit when something happened, I was now like a bump in the road, but um, but um, and I could go on to, you know, I could go on because I had the strength of character. And I'm not going to pretend that, you know, we call them the devils, uh, the devilish function. There are all this negative stuff that plays in your head. You know, you're not this, you're not that, you're not too old, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too poor, you're, you know. You can shut those voices up when you develop your spirit. You, you can recognize them for what they are. And then it's just like throwing water on a witch. They just, ooh, they shrivel up and go away. So, yeah, I mean, that's the biggest lesson I've learned through the years in my life is to take responsibility for whatever's happening to you. Don't blame the other person exercise your body your mind and your spirit every day and then you'll be happy and when you're happy you draw happiness to you so cause and effect <laughs> yeah i think that's a great life lesson to kind of leave people with i wanted to give you some time to you know plug your book as we've talked about it and where people can find you if they're looking for you great well thank you for that colton um so my book is called saving face and it's available on amazon and it, it's just saving face has a double meaning. So it means not only to, to look good when you get older, which was one of my intentions, but also to feel happy on the inside because one without the other is, is not good. When, you, when you're miserable, it shows on your face. When you're happy, it shows. <laughs> so we all want to be happy. So saving face by Vicki Lemaire, V-I-C-K-I. And then my last name is two words, L-E space, capital M-E-R-E. -E. Or you can go to my website for the book, VickiLamare.com. And I so appreciate your support and help me get this message out so that everybody can be happy and look great. Yes, of course. And if people go on there and they appreciate the book, remember to leave a good review because it helps your authors. 
Yes, it does. Thank you so much. I've gotten eight reviews and seven five stars so so awesome. far. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. I have appreciated it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Do you feel more informed having listened to this episode of the Just Dumb Enough podcast? If so, please take a brief moment to rate the show five stars on iTunes, Spotify, or Audible. If you really liked it, remember to subscribe for more episodes every week and check out the nearly 100 episode backlog I've built up. Let me know what you'd like to hear by reaching out to me and emailing dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com or by sending a message to any of the show pages on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever else you find me. I'm always looking for new topics, guest ideas, and questions from the audience. That's all for this week. Have a great weekend, and I will see you Monday the 12th to hear about how you might rescue the addict in your life. Buh bye bye